Like you're alive. Sound check. Sound check. This is as good as we can. Well, a uh, sound to check. Does this thing work? Does this work? Okay. It's not for the recording. It doesn't. Oh, it doesn't a PA system. Okay. Yeah, it, it's not for the PA system. It's for recording what we post later. Okay. And it's all set. Go for it. Let's just take two minutes and get the uh, system working. Get the who to work. We'll get the set. Do you want to change plugs or anything? No, we're good. Okay. We just need to find the program because the change in resolution moves stuff around on my screen. Yeah. Now you can go full screen. I like the reflection on the back of the. Where's the full screen control? Uh, up in the up right hand corner of the square. Near the red X. We're near the red X. Oh, this one. Yeah. Yeah. So I assume you want to get to your slides now? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Give it a minute to figure it out, and it should be you. You wouldn't? Okay, 30 seconds past the hour, according to the clock. Hi, my name is Ed Thielen. Hi, Ed. Hi. I used to um, uh, maintain a Nike system. The, pre, uh, the predecessor to this, but this is what we're going to show. This is a Nike Hercules up here. I was dealing with a Nike Ajax. It had a range of about 37 miles. This has a range on the order of 90 miles. Uh, the equipment was almost the same. I, I have the impression we have uh, up in uh, Marin County, there is a uh, Nike Hercules display, National Park Service, and I, I really think I could fix 90% of the stuff up there that that got inherited from the Ajax. Son of a gun, no. <laughs> it's operational as a, as a thing to go see and learn things. Oh, oh not like, yeah. ooh. No rocket to no RF. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Nothing that explodes? Nothing that explodes. You can put your hand on as you ride the elevator up. Oh. We, we occasionally explode at the administration, of course. And I, they're very kind about not exploding at us. So uh, I've got quite a bit of uh, gory detail. What I really wanted to do is to um, uh, announce what a wonderful person I am and all my background, how come I became a super techie and all that, but uh, we don't have time, so I'll have to crash on. Uh, so we're looking at this thing here, uh, but I wanted to, you know, I don't know how much food you have, and I want to wake you up. So with a little luck, we can take a look at the honeymooners 
and uh, Jackie Gleason loses again. Yeah, yeah, they do have a time, don't they? So anyway, back back to business. Uh, this presentation is about the Nike Hercules surface to air missile. Uh, it can be used surface to surface, but that was a later edition. And uh, then at the end of this, I want to show a game that I made that uh, permits one to be the battery control officer, designate targets, and so forth, which I think is a lot of fun. So we uh, continue on. Uh, the, the Nike Ajax got fielded around uh, 1953. I, I was got trained and went out onto a site around 1955. And this is what we were thinking of. This was the uh, bomber that the Russians had developed and they were making large numbers of them. And it could range one way from northern Siberia to Chicago, where I was at, and the, big pardon? I'm from Chicago. I remember where there was uh, the Nike site on the beach there. Yeah, yeah I, I was down there at uh, Prospect Point. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, what we call C41. Good heavens. I can see I'm going to have to be more honest. I have a... Um, <clears throat> A spy in the <laughs> midst here. <laughs> so uh, this is what we were uh, facing, and uh, we were quite serious about it. The Russians had misbehaved a little bit in the Cold War, Berlin bar blockade, and total non-cooperation. And the I got faced the draft at the end of uh, Korean War, and. Uh, you know, the Soviets helped sponsor the Korean War. So we were a little concerned. So this is a schematic of a Nike site. On the very right-hand side are what we call the acquisition radars. Uh, the, big round, the big round ball was a separate operation. The Nike site itself used the funny little... Does the mouse? Oh, I'm gonna, I can steer here. The, the um, uh, this is what we called our low power, low power antenna, one megawatt peak pulse, and uh, it could see out on the order of 150 miles, depending on the cross section of, of the uh, target. So then, uh, what would happen is the uh, Low par antenna goes into the battery control trailer, and the uh, battery control officer gets to designate things to the another trailer, and the, uh, the other trailer controls a target tracking radar. And these are very precise sorts of things. They can be uh, bore sighted uh, to a gnat's eyebrow, really. Um, they, they uh, use uh, monopulse, so on the back of the uh, little um, the six foot paraboloid sort of thing here uh, were four little windows and basically you compared the left window with the right window, that was your azimuth error, the top window with the bottom pair of windows, that was your elevation error. And every day or so we would check the bore sighting. They had a separate test mass not shown that you could uh, calibrate against. The, uh, an improvement over the Ajax was what they called the target ranging radar. Uh, this is a three centimeter, 10 uh, gigahertz machine. This is a 10 centimeter, three gigahertz machine. And this was a uh, two centimeter, 16 gigahertz uh, radar. The attempt was uh, that if you were flying uh, 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 several airplanes, the formation in, 
you're, you're kind of aware that, that airplanes have really wild patterns of various corners of an airplane reflecting in different directions. And so the result is that the uh, target r tracking radar tended to track the strongest signal in, in a formation and it would go back and forth to the strongest signal in the formation. And this was an attempt to get around that problem. So the got to make, so I'm a docent up there at this other place, and I get to babble on for as long as the audience holds attention. But I'm told that I have only an hour here, so I'm trying to stay confined to a reasonable amount of time. So uh, a little more on the history of this sort of thing. Uh, in uh, I mentioned in. Uh, 1953, they started fielding Ajax, and there were about two, 250 sites around the United States. Um, multiple sites around uh, Los Angeles, New York, uh, some SAC bases, like Travis Air Force Base, had a couple Nike sites. Uh, then uh, around 1968, uh, they replaced the Ajax with the more capable Nike Hercules that we showed the picture of. Uh, the Ajax could only use a, an explosive warhead because at that time, nukes were rather large. You know, now you could practically, seemingly put them in your pocket, but they were big at the time. The uh, Hercules had a, a diameter of an order of 30 inches and you could put a, a variable yield warhead in there and it does sound a little daffy to uh, uh, think of having an atomic bomb to, to try to defend yourself uh, there was quite a bit of effort to make sure it was no lower than uh, 4,000 feet when it went off and they uh, you know by any sort of accident and uh, also, they had about a thousand pound main warhead in there. The, the warhead idea is to have a lot of quarter inch hardened steel uh, fragments arranged outside of your main TNT charge. The idea is to fragment the, the uh, opposition. Uh, so these uh, these uh, missile sites got into uh, United States, and then they got sent to Germany. At the time, there was a lot of worry that the Soviets might decide to annex the rest of Germany, and uh, also Italy, Turkey, Greece, and Spain, and Norway uh, got some Nike sites. In Asia, they were over in Okinawa defending uh, long-range bases, and uh, Japan and South Korea. South Korea had like eight of them. And every now and then, the uh, MiGs would come down, roaring like hell, turn hard at the border, you know, just to try to wake up people. It, it, uh, they tried to keep people on the ball. Oh, that, last, that sort of thing lasted until about 1974. Then there was a variety of SALT treaties, and it was deemed, among other things, that these violated SALT to some extent. And at that time, the ICBMs were considered the major threat, and these are useless against anything going five miles a second. It, you know, it, it's just... You need a whole different technology. So, and um, actually, in, in 1978, for the foreign equipment, they went digital. I forgot to mention that the computer in there is an analog machine. Four four bays, one whole bay for a variety of power supplies. Another whole bay for potentiometers. You wouldn't believe, you know, this big around. And uh, two bays of uh, uh, amplifiers, very fancy. 
I was, we have a, somebody that sounds as though they know analog, and I should have brought a, a zero set switch to, to, to try to make tubes behave properly in a high gain amplifier. You know, to get zero out when you put in zero, you need extra equipment. So uh, that all lasted in foreign countries, and, but the last um, Nike site uh, was uh, taken out of service in uh, 2014 in Italy. And they now have quite a museum. And I believe that that stuff fires up still. They have radars and stuff? Yeah, I, I believe they could fire up the radars. They, they've, shown us, they've shown us displays. Uh, no, the, when the, the warheads were always under um, U.S. control, and the U.S. left with the warheads. We're not. 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 I got so excited up here, I've lost track of what I'm doing. Okay, so what I want to do now is to show the battery control officer's world. Uh, battery control officers had various other things to do, like mess officer and all the other stuff you make a poor second Louis do, but they were also trained to um, be the battery control officer, and this is basically his world when operating. This is a uh, plan position indicator. The various radars that were available could be displayed here. This gadget is an XY plotter. And we have some pens that, that we'll discuss a little later. And it, this is vertical plotting board to show the altitudes involved versus time to intercept. So that zero time is in the middle, and uh, they display the target in here, target altitude versus time to intercept. And in here, uh, the uh, predicted point of intercept. Uh, you're always trying to figure out where the missile is going to be when you think the uh, airplane is going to be near it. Predicted point and time of intercept. And then there's oh, quite a variety of switches that I'll discuss just a little bit in there. Yeah, for the vertical. Yeah, good enough. And in here, it plotted both the uh, target and, and uh, um, predicted point of intercept. And then when you launched, the predicted point, uh, it followed the missile instead of the predicted point of intercept. So I, I, I'll, I'll get that, you know, pounded in your head a little bit later. Okay, so what I'm showing here is a uh, negative of a screen uh, from the radars. And uh, so what, what the target tracking radar is looking at, uh, they have a cross on it to show what, what's going on. These are the usual blips from uh, targets and other aircraft. And this is a simulation of identification friend or foe. It's really considered uh, poor form to shoot down your friends. You know, there's an awful lot of paperwork you got to do if you do that, and nobody wants to, you know, it's a bad joke. And this is the XY plotting board again. There's two pens. In the simulation, I use different colored inks to try to make things plain. Here, they, they always used green ink. And if anybody's ever played with green ink suitable for this, you get it on your hands, and it's there for a while. It's just amazing. So we have uh, they have little lights to say 
which pen this is. It's a target or the predictive point of intercept or the target on or predictive point of intercept on this pen. And there's quite a, a little fancy circuit for when the pens contact or get too close, then they change function. They just reverse the function. So this is the vertical plotting board, and I'm going <laughs> to, I think you've got it nailed, but uh, what, what, what this is, two more plotting pens, and uh, the way I have it, the target is going to be here, target altitude versus time to predicted intercept. And the either the missile or the uh, predicted point of intercept versus time here, altitudes. And so when you see the when you see the simulation uh, and they, and you launch the you'll see a, a green line going up and this coming over here and they will intersect type thing. And, and these are some of the controls and we won't discuss too many of them, but available from the computer is the uh, target ground speed and the missile speed from the missile tracking radar. Uh, I didn't mention very much about the missile or missile tracking radar. A, the computer uh, sends, uh, figures out where they want the missile to go, left, right, up, down, or blow yourself up. Those commands are sent to the missile via the missile tracking radar. They use a pulse code sort of scheme to do that. Uh, they also provide fin orders, which is really not very much. You know, you can't do much about that. Here's the fire switch. It's not a button. You raise a red handle and can operate the switch. If the missile isn't doing what you want it to, nothing is perfect, you can burst it. Or if it's getting too close to friends, you can just disable a burst on it. Okay, so this is a picture of the game. And some of this uh, you'll recognize. This is the XY plotting board. The red is the uh, target. The red ink is the target. Uh, the green ink that's just starting is the missile. This is the same here. This is the planned position indicator with blips and the target being tracked is this cross here. Um, the IFF challenge, uh, we haven't challenged for a while and so it's faded out. The PPI is a long persistence tube. And so you'll see uh, as, the, as the target moves, uh, a faint track behind it. So you can guess the speed of, of a target in, in its direction. Uh, these are statuses involved. It has to be in red alert up there in order to uh, launch anything. It's, and red alert goes off with a siren. So if somebody's screwing around, uh, Everybody knows somebody's screwing around. Uh, computer settled. Uh, it takes a while for a computer to uh, try to figure out a predicted point of intercept. And so uh, also if the predicted point of intercept is beyond the, the, the range of the time, it, it never will settle. And so you have to have your computer settled and a variety of other things before you can launch. This is a, a simulation of a target in pretty close without much noise. This is your target tracking radar display. And I just put on, for the fun of it, the um, azimuth elevation and range. These, the operators uh, don't necessarily worry much about these numerics. And this is for the missile. The missile had a little transponder on it, and uh, it was no noise ever. It's, yes, sir? The target, is that 
higher and lower depending on range or signal strength? Uh, no, there's an automatic gain control circuit. So it's just the same height all the time? It's, it, it's always the same height. And it moves left to right? Yes. Range? L long range here, and then I simulate uh, noise. Because uh, the, 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 the target way out doesn't give much uh, return, and you wind up with grass as noise. Any more questions? Am I going too fast, too slow? Okay. So uh, this, this is more on the uh, uh, p uh, plant position indicator. I've kind of discussed it probably too much already. Uh, the IFF lines behind the track and cross, and uh, they do have uh, what they uh, angle things on the bezel. And uh, this is where you, the way you designate a target. I, I would do it. We would do it with the mouse here, but in the real system, it, it, you know, because you only see the trace coming around once every say five seconds, you don't know what you're doing if you just use a, a mouse sort of thing because you don't see the mouse. So what they really have is a distance ring that you can always see, and an azimuth line that's quite visible. And that's the way they designate to the other van, the target tracking van people, uh, what target they want tracked. Uh, and then in the, the target tra uh, tracking people, there's three of them, uh, they've got a good idea of the range and the azimuth, good enough to, to get a good signal, but nobody knows the elevation on these things. The, um, ac ac the acquisition radar deliberately sprays <laughs> all around and high and low. It sends out a fan like that to, to see everything, but the net result is low, medium, and high airplanes all look the same. Uh, so the elevation operator, when the azimuth and range are right, it moves the antenna up and down until they get a signal. Okay, so this is the target tracking radar uh, with noise, simulated noise. And it tends to look like this at long ranges. And I, I've never seen jamming, and I am glad I never did, because jamming a weak signal like that sounds like duck soup, you know. It, but people say they can do it. There's a variety of controls in the uh, tra uh, target tracking tra uh, trailer to uh, change frequencies and change pulse widths and try to play games against jamming, but it's, it's, it's like looking into, the, imagine, the sunset while you're driving a car. It's damn unpleasant at best. Okay, so now we have a, uh, the XY thing, a little more detail, if you wish. And uh, it's in, uh, calibrated in thousands of yards. Everything is a yard, uh, roughly a meter for metric lovers. And here's, uh, instead of green ink, we're using red for the target and yellow for the predicted point of intercept. And here's the vertical plotting boards again. And uh, we have a, 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 the, uh, a presentation of the system status. Uh, one of the interesting things, what time are we playing with? Better? About half an hour. Yeah. Um, on a missile, a missile has to, we, we depend on the missile knowing where down is. So they have a little gyroscope in there so that they, uh, that, that down is uh, perpendicular to the little gyroscope. And, uh, but because the, the, plane, uh, the missile goes like this a lot, uh, it can 
tumble the gyro if you're, if you're off 90 degrees to uh, your predicted point of intercept. They set the gyro rotating for the predicted point of intercept. And that's the way they figure down when you're giving commands up down. And now, the game. Uh, we've had a little trouble with getting this coordinated with the uh, visual system here, so I, I need uh, Kevin uh, to, to fire up this other system. Well... Uh, yeah, I was hoping to switch to the other display, and he may have uh, the game up already. Okay. Okay. Okay, now we got to find... Kevin, help! It never fails. One always needs to be right. <laughs> I just plugged it in. Is that the only thing you do? Or? Sure. I'm not seeing it up there. Is there something? It'll come in a second. It's just half stuck. No, I'm out here, and then it'll figure it out. Okay, now can we go full screen on that some way? That's as full as it's going to get. Okay, so here, I'll click it and see what happens. It's, it's good enough, I guess. Okay. Okay, so this is Should the game I wrote. Auto? Oh, no, no, no. I'll, 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 I, I, if it goes auto, it goes too fast. And, okay. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's keep it manual then. Let's I think it died when we went full screen here. Let's try it again. Yeah, it locks up when you do that, so let's leave it in mostly full screen. All right. Okay, I need your chair. Okay. Thank you. You're, uh... <laughs> but he's on overtime. I'm retired. <laughs> okay. If we can... Oh, mouse. Oh, goodness. Okay. So, yeah, we're, uh... Yeah, that's fine. Except, yeah, there's a mouse up there. Okay, so you've seen some of these before. And I'm going to try to get rid of this Android thing here. Oh, that wasn't on the real... Uh... No. There we go. And um, you're going to have to take the faith that a little blip at the bottom is a missile tracking... Uh, uh, response, but it's a little boring because it's always great. So, uh, what we want to do now is uh, give off an IFF challenge to try to find out who our friends are. Okay, so we find out who our friends are. So we decide we want to designate this guy for some reason. He's close. Oh, this is going to be interesting. The mouse is not calibrated to the screen in this system. Except, okay. Uh, so we're going to go to automatic, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, because I uh, I read the most. Okay, so you want to pick that guy? Is that what uh, you yeah. want? There. Okay, he's not designated for some reason. Okay. So let's try plugging in a real mouse. I haven't done this in so long, I forget where the spigot is. It, it, I hope... 
that it calibrates differently. Oh, it usually works better. Okay. So okay. Well, let's just go automatic because it, right. uh, it. Okay. So we're now playing the game in automatic, and uh, the battery commander is being simulated by the computer, except he's really fast. And uh, so uh, we're, we're tracking uh, this aircraft. And you'll notice the green line in the right-hand screen is uh, he's launched already, and he's up and running. Now he's diving. Is, it, is that fairly visible on the big screen? It's up on the right-hand Yeah, okay. See, uh, I don't know if I can see the green, but those little cursors are, at, are simulated uh, pens. And so we're going to explode that airplane just about now. And that's my attempt at showing the airplane fragmenting on, on the uh, target tracking radar. So now he's looking for another target to look for, uh, to track and attack. And he hasn't made up his mind yet. I guess he's looking for the closest one. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, within range for the moment. Uh, we have two targets: one coming in from the top, and one from the left. That uh, we'll settle on in just a minute. Uh, well, the, I'm presuming that the battery commander uh, watching the tails of these knows which is coming in and its range, and you can guess at the speed by the length of the tail on the uh, thing. And uh, so it would be a little smarter than this uh, computer is right now. I don't know. I really don't know. I should ask, because we, we have a, uh, a guy that was a battery commander as a docent, and so I asked him about when do you launch, and he says you launch uh, just about when the predicted point of intercept is within range, so you tend to launch early. Would you have time for a second shot? Yeah. Okay. So now we're in range. The computer got settled, and we're now uh, launching a, uh, a, a missile. And we'll, we'll simulate that as the um, range gets closer, that there's less noise on the uh, less grass on the screen. So you'll notice that this uh, aircraft is about 38,000 feet, and uh, he's flying straight. There, there's a version in here you can uh, have the uh, aircraft 
wobble um, on five second intervals uh, two, uh, two tenths of a G and uh, one G. If we can do that in just a minute. So, oh, um, okay. Uh, you'll notice that uh, we go up about 40,000 feet uh, when we're attacking an uh, aircraft. The thing is launched vertically and then you dive it towards the target. Okay, so I'm showing the battery commander seeing that. Oh, 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 I didn't mention that. Uh, we, we don't run it ballistic. That, that would have a higher path. And we don't run it zero Gs, you know, direct. The, uh, we, we do a half G semi-ballistic um, path. And that's a good compromise between getting to the target in a hurry and drag for range. <coughs> so I. Well, it, 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 yeah, it, uh, it, we, we fly at one half G um, trajectory, and we can do seven Gs in, 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 when there's reasonable atmosphere. And we're limited like an aircraft. Uh, a U-2 at you know, 70,000 feet can't pull many Gs, and neither can we. So uh, you'll notice that the aircraft is going up and down and causing all sorts of uh, uh, wiggles in the green line. Uh, actually, I, what I didn't put in, I forgot to put it in, is they use a smoothing algorithm so that when an aircraft is doing something like that, we, we don't chase the predicted point of intercept quite that strongly. Uh, I, I didn't hear. Oh, yeah, uh, by definition. I, I never fail. <laughs> oh, I, I forgot. I forgot. You can fail. So, was the Viking missile under fire in Agger? Neither kind? At uh, an actual target? Not that we know of. Well, they, they shot off. Several thousand in, in um, training exercises, and every year they'd send a crew to uh, some range to make sure that, that the people could uh, adjust the missiles and they deliberately mess up the adjustments in the hands, and then they'd uh, have to get things straightened out and then fire. Um, yeah, the, down near White Sands is McGurga Range. People in the continental United States went there. Uh, Anchorage had a site up on a mountain. That's where the Canadian, uh, the uh, Alaska people went. Uh, the Greeks went to Crete, and the Germans went to Crete. The Turks, we can't mix the Turks and the Greeks. So the Turks went to Sardinia. Uh, they flew over Crete to go to Sardinia to fire. <laughs> the real world. So, 60,000 feet. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what, what time is it? Okay, yeah, question time. To, uh, to use offsets, they wanted to fly and then have a missile go to a point not very close to the aircraft that go to an offset point. And somebody corrected that and scared the crap. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the drones are 
fairly expensive, uh, the, the real aircraft drones, and uh, even the little RCATs that they're using, you know, with a wingspan of 10 feet, are reasonably expensive. So later on, what I thought that it was fakey was that they would fly to a point. They would simulate an aircraft out there. And, you know, it, 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 to me that isn't real, but I guess it saved them bucks. Let's see what else. Uh, Describe how one uses a potentiometer as a computational element. You're driving the arm around with a motor? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of servo motors in this thing. We have a whole cabinet full of, of potentiometers. Uh, time being very important. They'd ha they had a big one for, you know, 150 seconds into... 10 seconds, but then they wanted the, the division and multiplications and so forth. There's seven cards and seven signals that are picked off of the uh, of the cards in there. It's a ganged potentiometer, as it were, in oil. Uh, so they, they flip to a different potentiometer at 10 seconds so that the um, errors in the potentiometer windings and so forth were reduced that way and they were more accurate. Uh, yeah, a lot of servo motors. The uh, system was uh, all uh, 400 hertz. 400 hertz is used in aircraft a lot. The trans iron in transformers, uh, you need a lot less iron in your transformers at 400 than you do at 60. And uh, so that big. Yeah, yeah. And the the game plan for these things was that they wanted to be air transportable. So uh, we really had two vans in, in the fire control area, one where the battery commander sat and one where the radar operators, uh, tracking radars sat. And people wonder, why two? Well, it's so that you could get these two trailers on, onto a railroad car or onto some of the aircraft uh, that can carry enormous loads. Is that too small? I, I, I'm not much into aircraft. I only shoot at them. C-130 should be able to take both. But they didn't have C-130s until, when? 50s or 60s, right? Really, or a few seconds. I don't know. It's been a long yeah. time. <laughs> so they, they did have reserve um, units down in um, Fort Bliss, Texas. And when the Cuban Missile Crisis went off, uh, eight, uh, two battalions, eight, eight systems, uh, got loaded onto trains in uh, quite a hurry and got into Florida and were mostly operational within about 10 days. Uh, I knew one of the battery commanders, and he'd, he, he'd been a bulldozer operator as a kid. And so here's the battery commander operating the bulldozer. When, you know, it's kind of an unusual situation. How many have been to the Nike site at Fort Perry? Oh, how fun! Okay. In it or to it? To it, to see? I've been at the door and told me you can't get in and walk too late. Oh, okay, yeah. And we have open house the first Saturday of every month. And uh, so next Saturday, I guess, is no, almost. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Bunker. Yeah, they, they, they won't let people ride on the elevator anymore. They, 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 the administration thinks that that's too dangerous. <laughs> yeah, it. it it, it, you know, the administration and the volunteers have different viewpoints on everything. Let me tell you how this works. Or pieces of missile, and if you put your hand on it, and there's a nanny, or does it, they're watching you, making sure everybody's got their hands on the reminder. And the little ones are all grabbed before the elevator starts up. And obviously, this is too dangerous, and you've got to stop it. 
That's a very slow <laughs> well, well, it's, you know, it'll still chop your arm out <laughs> after a long while. Oh, in a slow, painful way, sure. <laughs> 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 so, if you're interested in books, I have this one if you care to look at it. You have to open it because I haven't yet. The Last Missile Sight uh, An Operational Physical History of the Nike Site SF 88. If you want to read about Nike missile systems, what? It's of supersonic steel? Uh, yeah, that's another one. Supersonic steel, rings of supersonic steel, lists all the, all the uh, systems in the United States and uh, gives quite a bit of information, uh, the historical, which unit was in uh, Chicago, uh, you know, what uh, C-41 had such and such units and C-43 at Belmont, whatever, yeah. So his website is on his handout. And we'll have his slides. We'll, will you send the slides? To sure. So yeah. So you can have them on our website. Okay. You can have this simulator so that you can actually see how it works and play with it. Uh, if uh, if you care to do that at the break for a short time, uh, we'll have it uh, available for your amusement. Uh, I guess that's, um, unless there's some... A buddy wants to hear what a great person I am. That okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it turned itself off. It's like magic. <laughs> All right. I allege the thing is psychic. It knew when we were done. I allege somewhere. Can I take a minute while you're switching? Sure. Um, green arrays is trying to pull itself together a little bit. We have gotten an angel or devil investor and has given green arrays some Bitcoin to fund his work and it looks like we're going to be getting a project going this next year and maybe be able to show something a year from now. And that's all I'll say about it because it looks like it's going, oh, it's going to be in Greg's version of Polyport that he calls Sane for it, not the version of Fork that you're all familiar with in doing stuff with green arrays or intelligence like color fork. That is going away and it's going to be in a text-based environment. Oh, yes! I wanted a souvenir. Sorry. <laughs> Too obvious, I guess. Is it working? Clip it. Clip it to your shirt. Otherwise, you yeah, can't hear anything. Okay, good. Just because of once burned, twice shy. Yeah. yeah. All right, so this is just a, a quick and formal update on um, on the exploration of, um, of what we hoped was the original fourth implementation. And this uh, came about because of a group of people who had been um, looking to find if, if anyone had saved the, the fourth that Chuck Moore developed for the IBM 1130 at Mohasco, but that was before he had had a second person using fourth. He had, he had moved on before it really began to be used by other people, and so I, I don't think, other than a few internal documents and, and um, the material, there wasn't uh, a record of it. But, um, but it turned out that, um, he, although at this point he didn't have any material currently when people were contacting him, we found in an archive an email from maybe, I forget, it was, I think it was maybe a decade ago, where he had responded to somebody and said, I do have some material, I'll photocopy it and send it to you. And I found that attachment. 
and it uh, consisted of two parts. One was an assembler program for the IBM 1130 computer, which was the the, the very core of fourth, really, the, you know, the dictionary and uh, interpreter and uh, the, the very bare minimum. And then there was another section. So on the, the assembler listing uh, in Chuck's handwriting, it said original fourth. So that was a very good sign. But the, the other part of it was a set of, of something that uh, somebody coined proto fourth because it doesn't quite look like fourth we know today, but if you go back and read a lot of the um, historical publications, the documents that Chuck put out about how Forth evolved from his earliest work and some of the other early instances, you, you start to see it really is, but with you know a couple of oddities. So um, using the, the period as a, as a synonym for define, which doesn't work very well, um, you know, if you if you wanted to use it to see what's at the top of the stack, for example, so the the proto fourth isn't you know exactly what you'd recognize, but it's it's really all there. The thing that made it pretty hard to um, to recognize was that it's an admixture of things which are machine language for an IBM 1130, as well as uh, text that you would you would see as fourth. And of course, the idea was to get performance out of it, so it tried to get things into machine code and execute 1130 machine instructions rather than interpreting anything at a higher level. Um, so that part that was this proto fourth, Chuck really wasn't sure what it was. So he didn't say this was the definitive final one, but it seemed to have a lot of the, the functions built up for a working fourth system. So we got it running on an IBM 1130 simulator that Brian Niddle has, has uh, built and publicly available and, um, and began to experiment with it. So really figuring out what this thing did required a mixture of skills. I only had some of them. So I knew the 1130 really well, its machine architecture, and had studied all of these historical papers on the philosophy behind Forth and what he was doing and how it changed when he moved it to a burrow system and then to something else. Um, but I'm not all that much of a fourth uh, expert, and so that part of it I, I sort of stumbled along through. I figured out also that part of the, the goal for performance and really completely in sync with, with the philosophy behind Forth was to completely do away with the operating system, the monitor, the file system, and anything else on the 1130, and just go out there and directly manage the hardware. And so this Forth system, as it built itself up, defining more and more powerful uh, um, um, verbs and, and um, adding functionality, built interrupt handlers in machine code, built all of the I.O. instructions in machine code, hard-coded locations, so it would decide where on a disk pack it was going to put something that was just hard-coded in the fourth, didn't show up in anything the 1130 monitor knew, so if you listed the contents of the pack, they were, they were really independent, overlapping, dual rulers of the, the, the domain. So I um, spent a lot of time stepping through it, focusing on it, watching it build up, and, and was getting more and more excited that I had, you know, the one and true original fourth, you know, zero instance of it. Um, it's, it, again, I, I understand this is a, a pretty standard fourth concept, but it, there's sort of two modes for things. You can define something and the dictionary just stores the text string for later interpretation, or you can use the, the keyword he used at the time was code, and it would create the 1130 code for it and store that instead in the dictionary. So if you issued that verb you had just defined, it would branch into it and execute and then come back to the fourth interpreter. So um, a, a lot of that um, sort of porpoise back and forth between the execution level and the textual level, and I had to um, work my way through that to, to focus on it. It was a little difficult to work with because there was no period operators, no way to see what the top of the stack was. So I could stop the machine and look and see what was on the stack, but that was a little annoying. So I bashed my way through writing some in this proto fourth, writing a, 
uh, overloading the dot command so I could issue it and it would type what was at the top of the stack. So began to really feel comfortable there. But I did notice that on the um, on the protoforth, the, the multiple pages of very dense protoforth statements that Chuck had written that build itself up to a running forth system, there were a few places where Sharpie had like crossed something out and changed one constant from 140 to 141, which turned out to be a correction to the actual size of the disk sector. Um, so I realized that this was an intermediate Listening. This was a listening while he was debugging something, and he had written some changes, and there was a subsequent version that he had done from that. Um, and in fact, I found there there was a, a one place where there was some code that was clearly and obviously wrong, where it was supposed to, you know, list list a, a certain section of the disk block. You know, you want to look at what this string of the this area of the disk block, and he had fouled up the sequence of the things in the stack, so it was not working correctly, and I had to actually modify the code to fix it. So I now that it really couldn't have been version zero because it didn't work. Um, I'm hoping that it's close enough that I can get it functional. It um, his his method of using disk includes a lot of sort of work areas that he builds up that are opaque is, is it maybe even an understatement. So I'm, I have to reverse engineer whatever it is he had in mind to figure out how this disk support was supposed to work to be able to fetch all the different blocks of disk, you know, as you ask to bring the editor in or do something else or ex extend the language. Um, so I don't have whatever you would have had for the full editor that people are used to to edit text. All of those are not there in the in the protoforth that exists. So I'm imagining that was another block that he had on disk, and I just don't have a copy of that. So that's where I'm at now. Um, I'm going to um, to keep working on if I can figure out how to make the full disk function work. Um, I think it's usable as a early version of forth, albeit not identical to what you know from later. And, and probably is fairly close to version zero, even if I would have liked it to have been, you know, the actual day zero code. So, any questions or? Yeah. Are you interested in having more participants? And by the way, when you hear a question, you need to repeat it for the internet okay. audience. So the the question is, am I interested in having more participants? And yet, yes, I am. I've, there are a couple of people who have been working on it already such as Bob Flanders, who, who's the one who received the original email a decade or so ago. So we've had a few people talking about it, and I'd, I'd be happy to have other people bash at it. The sort of challenge you face is that it dives into IBM 1130. You have to know it's a 16-bit machine. These bits are the op code. Here's, here's how it works, um, the addressing, as well as understanding fourth. Um, but I'd be happy to have other people um, participate. So I'll, I'll give you information. On the, on the email list and you can help them learn about the 1130 yeah exactly yeah right so we I was trying to create yeah one of my um, my sort of stretch goals for this was I was going to annotate everything in his assembler code and in the proto fourth explaining it so when he would say define LD is this this is an 1130 load instruction the op code it's going to be ORed with some other things to create the executable instruction so my goal was to have this very long document that did that. I've got a little bit of it, and hopefully I'll, I'll with help of other people, we can complete that. Great. Anything else? Any questions? Or? I have an odd update. OK. <laughs> uh, can I borrow your, phone, uh, your mic? You have an odd update. OK. Yeah. A second. About About uh, 25 years ago, I went to Hawaii and uh, decided, uh, the Big Island, decided to go up Mauna Loa, you know, to see Keck and so forth. So I uh, rented a little car. They say always go up in a, in a four-wheel tough vehicle. 
and the little car people says, don't go up the mountain. Well, I found out why. Anyway, so I got up there, and near the top, the poor little car was, I almost had to push it. The wife had to get out of the car, and she didn't like the altitude very much either. And um, since I was just a casual visitor, most of the observatories were locked. But I got into one. It's the French-Canadian observatory that has a fairly sizable instrument up there. And uh, the door was unlocked. So I got, got in there and got to chatting with the fellow. And he said that uh, he had the last fourth system on the mountain. And everybody else was now converting to C++ and all of that stuff. <laughs> and uh, so um, he was a little sad because he knew fourth, and they were, they were going to convert the French-Canadian telescope and so forth to C++. And so we had trouble with, uh, that's the end of the fourth update. Then we had to go down the hill. Dear friends, uh, don't take a little subcompact car on that mountain. You know, you put it in the low gear, you, the engine whees. You know, you, you're hurting your poor little engine. You know, I, you, you hate that. And the, I was afraid the brakes would get too hot. So uh, you follow the instructions. Okay, thank you very much. make an announcement that, uh, all right, I wanted to be sure to make an announcement that Andreas is still selling books. Uh, if uh, you want some of a piece of uh, history, uh, Glenn Hayden's stash of published works, uh, all of that stuff still available. I wanted to be sure to mention that the uh, SVFIG t-shirt is still uh, available for your, uh, for your uh, wearing pleasure. Uh, very nice, 100% cotton, beautiful silk screen, uh, just very pleasant. Uh, Dwight, are you about ready to light the fuse here? Okay. Okay. So we'll pop that out and haul this off. I wanted to remind you that uh, Ed's uh, game, uh, his simulation, is going to be available on his website. So if you want to download that and play with it. Uh, <laughs> so why don't we take a, a couple of minutes of uh, pre-break break. break.
<laughs> Is this for blackmail purposes? I'll pay, I'll pay. <laughs> Probably put it off to the side with the beard. Is this like something with a No, there's no ones. Okay. That would be nice. Yeah. Massage techniques would be better. But no, no, they just at least the desk raise it. Very quickly I told them that you don't have to give any of this stuff away or don't have to down every day. Am I live here? Can you tell? Um, the microphone. Microphone. Yeah. Hello, hello. You are alive. Okay. That works. Somebody's behind that microphone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is the this is a computer here. This is the the other part. Cable. That's a cable. That's a laptop. Remember uh, whose uh, who's serial this was? This was written by. Um, I don't remember who what, what his name was. I'm embarrassed now. Let me get in here for a second. Oh yeah. McEwen, Andrew McEwen. That works great now. You got the flower. Yeah. So, Murphy wins again. Yes, sure. It's what okay. I, I don't want to focus that close. Oh, what a demonstrate. Uh, you it's hard to focus that. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes just, just moving it back my, my other a camera. small amount. You can always you can always crop the picture. combination of being close and high yeah, magnification. Actually, only one one. Yeah, I was I always, I always end up taking bigger pictures and then yeah, blow them up and crop them. I don't either, but it, 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 it can work. Well, it depends on the camera you got. I have one of those. Uh, it's an older, it's an older D, D, D10, Canon D, D10. But even though it's not enormous pixels, it's very, very does very good at, at being able to just take the picture and make it bigger. Let's see if I can do that. 
I think so. floppy emulator, which I still have projects going on. That's the reason why, if you look at the file name up there, it says, uh, wherever it was, it says it's it says F, F105, but we're actually going to talk about the F103 today, which is, am I in the picture? Yeah, I guess I am. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, anyhow, this little board here is an F103 board. It's a, it fits on a, you can put it on a 40-pin socket. It uh, uses the uh, uh, STM32F103 chip. It has uh, 20K of RAM and, and 64K of flash. Uh, you can get these, if you know where to shop for them, for less than $2 a piece. So, so these, are, these are kind of pr pretty cool. Uh, these are oftentimes referred to as a blue pill. You can use them through the Arduino interface, but at the price you lose some of your flash in order for their bootloader because they have to be a bootloader that's compatible with their, with their IDE. So um, uh, I don't use their bootloader. I go in and just raw load the flash. There is a code. It, it's in a protected area inside the uh, processor that, that will allow you to uh, uh, flash the uh, uh, stuff in there if you do the right instructions in the right sequence at the right time. Uh, it took me a while to figure out how to do it, even with the instructions. I had the uh, the PDF from from these guys here, but I was able to figure it out. So uh, I have I have one file that has everything in it. It has the code to to download. It's got the a terminal emulator in it, and it's also got uh, code to upload or download things from, from this guy that if you want to, like, say you want to do a dump or something like that, you can do a dump. And uh, uh, the uh, actual fourth I put on this was uh, Dr. Ting's fourth. He had one that was designed for the, uh, the F407 uh, part, which is much more flexible than this one. And I had to on-flex it just to get it in here. Um, I used... Uh, Initially, for the first pass, I, I used the, uh, the the Kyle assembler, which uh, at, apparently they've gotten tired of giving away free copies. What I got was a 30-day trial. So um, the the first version I got working on the F105, and then I later picked up this. So I had to manually edit machine code to get it to fit into this guy in a number of places because there's a number of constants and other things. You have to understand how to make constants with the uh, with the thumb uh, instruction set. It's it's easy to make an 8-bit, relatively easy. You can shift it anywhere you want, up and down, with zeros in the empty spaces. Uh, there are a number of other ways that you can make constants, but usually they're like 
like you can have a5, 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 something like that. You can do, you can other, do some other constants. But anyhow, it took me a while to actually figure that out. Luckily, I had, at that time, I had a working version of fourth. So what I did is I, is I made a, a dummy definition, said no up, no up, no up, no up, no up. And then since his, his fourth is, is designed with these uh, uh, local branches, right, or local calls, the, uh, you can put inline an instruction as though it was part of that sequence, and then it will it'll execute that. So, so all I had to do was, was put my trial instruction in there, and then I could, I could actually test to see if it was doing what I really thought it should do. So I could manipulate the registers and things. So that's what I did. Uh, and so I got the, got the fourth on, onto this. Uh, like I said, the original code was, uh, that's me fading away here. Uh, the original code was, was, was from Dr. Dr. Ting, and I've modified it a bunch because there are a number of differences between this, this older F100 100 series parts and the F400. Like, for instance, the flash you write to as words instead of 32 bits. So you use 16-bit uh, values instead of 32 bits. So there's a number of subtle differences. Uh, his fourth is, is designed so that when you get done, you can turn key it, which just basically copies it into flash. It does run in, in, in RAM, so you use all your RAM. I'm hoping to eventually modify it a little bit so... I can separate what I call construction words, words that you would never use in your in your final final use. Put those, leave those in Flash, and then and then uh, only only the, the the words that you're building that you expect to run fast in in the RAM. the The RAM runs in the core and it runs at full speed up to 72 megahertz, whereas the Flash only can run half that speed at 30 36 megahertz. So it's a you, if you want to run the flash, it's, it's a little slower. But there's more flash than there is RAM, so there's an advantage to that. So, uh, like I said, uh, these, are, these are easy to get. They're, they're cheap. Uh, they're almost throwaway. The only, the only trick is you, you, have, you have to learn how, how to use them. I did put, uh, put my code um, and, a, and a, a hex dump of what goes in here. So if anybody wants to play with it, it's up on, 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 on GitHub. Uh, I don't have a listing for it anymore because, like I said, it's very hand modified. But it's, you could use a, a, a list file from, from, from Dr. Ting's as, a, as an example because it's very close to that. I didn't move things around that much. There were some... Uh, uh, I did leave an empty space at the beginning because I want to have the um, the vector tables for all the interrupts in there. He left no 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 provision for for sticking interrupts in there. So I have a I have a blank space at the beginning uh, that moves everything up up upstream a, a constant. But other than that, uh, I could show some some of the stuff that you can do. Um, I. Uh, Started with uh, 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 Andrew, Andrew McCune's, uh, I'm, I'm using Win, Win432. I, I use and, Andrew McCune's uh, uh, serial interface, which uh, if we go back over here, you can see that uh, it's, it's very much just his, his code at the start here that uh, to get things going, he's got it very object oriented. And uh, then I then I uh, I go down below here, and then these are these are things that are that are necessary for the uh, for for the bootloading. Uh, it uses the, an act character or a NAC character for whether or not you're successful or unsuccessful. Uh, then I have a number of ways to break out of things, like I have the word "oops," which just reinitializes the uh, the, the, the COM port. Uh, quiet I use for a while. I'm not using it currently. What it does is sometimes there's a lot of extra noise coming back from, uh, from uh, some operation. You want to make it quiet. You can tell it to, to keep quiet. And then I, have, uh, I use safe key quite, quite a bit because sometimes you do the wrong thing and it just hangs. Right? And so you wanna, if you have it waiting for a key, you oftentimes have to reboot your fourth. So this one here allows me to break from my, uh, from my key sequence. It's you know, pretty simple stuff. Uh, then you can see here's 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 my first 
important word, and that's and that's the ACK and the NAC. So it just ba basically lets you know whether or not after you did an operation in there uh, using their 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 bootstrap to uh, whether or not it worked or not. Uh, it has a real simple checksum method. It just X, it's an XOR sum, not even shifted. So it's 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 pretty straightforward. You can see it's just take the old value XOR and and put it put it to put the new value in. Uh, this one here I, is is my uh, uh, what you do when you when you're doing a boot. I'm going to put this this processor in the boot mode. So you can, we'll go, we'll go through a whole sequence here so you can see what goes on. You just change one of these little jumpers here, and it puts it into the bootstrap mode, which are really easy to do. Okay, I'm gonna do a reset. Okay, so I've loaded this this code over here, so we'll, we'll just go ahead and uh, let me move this over here so we're not overlapping too much. We'll move this guy back over this way because I don't need all that stuff on the left. That'll make it nicer, more friendly. Okay, so I've I've read I've read, and notice that it start F one hundred five even though this is a one hundred three, the 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 uh, functions are the same. So it just because that was my first uh, use of it. So I'm going to start it, and hopefully I will get an ACK, and I did. Okay, ACK tells me now that it knows that I you know that I'm talking to it. It knows the baud rate that I have and the ser serial port that I'm using on on the device. It can choose different serial ports, so you, you don't have to use one particular one. And and it's it's set up to the baud rate that I'm running at uh, 56 uh, K baud. I, I leave it in e even parity because it requires even parity for its code. And so when I even just, I'm talking to the fourth, it's still in even parity. As far as I'm concerned, it's just an extra bit. It slows it down one fractional part <laughs> of the sequence. But other than that, it's, uh, so that's the most unusual thing. Most people use no, no parity nowadays, and it, it requires even parity. Then, uh, then I then I have a bunch of low-level words that I that I that I use for for sending stuff to the uh, uh, to the to, to, to the board. Uh, there's this one command here that we can do. I'll just cut and paste it so I don't mess up the typing. Oops, I just destroyed it. That was nice. Where's my editor? I'm not watching my fingers. Sorry, folks. There, I'll put it back. Okay. But basically, this, if you have the uh, the, the 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 PDF that you have, uh, you can. Uh, uh, see what all of these different commands do. These are the commands that are that are valid for this particular part. Each part may or may not have all the commands. So so I can send it send it a particular command and it will execute it. And that's what we do later on. So one of the one of the things that you might want to do is you is you might want to um, uh, Look, look at a at, at a, a memory dump, say for instance, of the of of the memory. So well, you have to know where your flash is, and of course, oops, excuse me, I'm in the wrong place again. I do that all the time. Um, one four. There we go. Uh, let's see. The, this dump only works for numbers less than um, so I can I can extract the data from the from the flash that's in there. These FFs are my empty space for my for my interrupt tables. So since I just looked at the beginning of the flash, so I know I'm actually talking to it. But uh, one thing that you might want to do, of course, is uh, it has read protection read protection and and write protection so 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 you might want to uh un, unprotect your uh your your uh computer at the first because you don't know what status it's it's really in right so the first thing you might want to do is you might want to un, un unprotect 
the uh, the reed. The reed is the most important one. If you don't have the reed uh, unprotected, it, it will it will it will hang. So let's see if it's still running yet here. Uh, look and see. The one thing that I found is that it. I hate long addresses. <laughs> let's do another uh, twenty dump. Twenty dump dump read. Okay. Oops. Undefined. Yeah, it's undefined. Make sure I'm in hex too. One of the bad parts about this processor is until you've actually put a uh, an exception interrupt in there for it, if it does an address exception, it basically just hangs. So. So that's it makes it a little clumsy, but that's something can be patched at a at a uh, later date. Read mem, okay. Let's see, that should work. Yeah, no, it's that's 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 the other thing. For some reason or other, when you do these protect and unprotects, even though it comes back with the axe like it's supposed to, it uh, doesn't always uh, come back correctly. So, but anyhow, so. Uh, after after doing the the, the read protect and the and the write on protect rather, then you can then you can update the flash, which is what we're going to do here in a second. I'm going to erase the flash, so we'll just go through and and erase some. That's another operation I have down here. That's this one here. This is the the name here is right out of their their uh, thing. I would have given a better better name, but that's that's the name that they give it. This is erase memory, E-M, right? So I did it again. Mouse over here. I need an auto raise. Um, on my Linux at work, I have auto raise on, and I, I'm so used to doing it, I, I can't stop myself. I want to type, okay, so I'm just going to start from the beginning of Flash and, and maybe erase uh, uh, three blocks. So what I'm typing is is the the blocks I want to erase and the number and the count that I'm going to give it, and that uh, that works pretty quickly. So what it's telling me is it's telling me now that those places are are available to actually put code in, and we will do that here in just a second. And then uh, we'll just look at that so you can see that it's that it did take everything to FFs, including the first part here. Where is it here? Dot read. So far, I haven't done anything other than, you know, manipulate things with their with their with their boot bootloader. So now comes the more fun part: is we can actually stick real code in it to execute something. We will do that. And I have it. It's kind of a kind of a fixed operation. I, I, I you can scroll down to it. Like I said, this code is here is 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 on on Git GitHub, so you can go in and look at it if you want to see how to talk to these things. Yes. All right, I'll send that link to the email list. Okay. If one wants to contact you to find out how your loader works. Yeah, there's some instructions. You know, there, there are instructions there uh, that I that I put. There's a text file that goes that goes with it. Yeah. Um, if if anybody still has questions, they can email me at d k e l v e y uh, at at hotmail .com. My first two initials, D K and then E L V E Y, last name. Okay. So this this is actually going to update update the flash. I'm just overwriting locations that uh, that I didn't erase. I didn't erase the whole thing. If you want to erase the whole thing, you got to put down zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then nine for the count, and then E M, because it's it's uh, nine nine blocks worth of worth of worth of memory. The memory block size, of course, are different than the four four hundred seven, of course, also. So so that's 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 a little different. This is the address that it's at. So the fourth that's in there is uh, is twenty three hundred hex. It's a little larger than uh, Dr. Ting's original because I have a few added words that I've added in there. But uh, we can see now that uh, if I put it back to the on boot mode. 
that I now have a working fourth, if everything worked correctly, of course. Okay, and then of course I just have a simple word called talk, which, uh, which puts it into a, uh, a terminal mode. And there it is, it's, the fourth is out there. So now I have a, an actual fourth out there. Um, let me see here, there's a, uh, uh, I'm trying to think where I put that. Uh, one of the things, of course, they always like to do with the uh, uh, the um, uh, the, Ar Ar the Ar Arduino's is, is they always like to like to, like to do a blink the light, so we can do that here. I don't remember the name of the file, but we will find it. I just need to know the name of it. What is it called? Hex patch. I think it's just LED. Let me see if that's it. Oh, and of course it dumps it way back at the beginning. Let me go over here. There it is, LED, that one, that's what I want. Okay. Uh, so uh, I have to be in the, uh, in, in the Win32. What I don't like about it is, of course, it has a, like, almost the same OK. <laughs> but you'll notice there's one more space in front of it for the, for the Win32 than there is for the other one. So, so that helps you keep track of, of which, which, which version you were in, right? But uh, the, um, uh, uh, this one here will let me uh, load F105. LED F103. Can't find the file. Load F105 LED F103.f. I can't find it. Okay. There it is. Okay, let's try it with caps and see if that looks any better. Uh -huh. This worked perfectly at home. Of course. <laughs> well, that should work. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so 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 yeah, the uh, the fourth in in here is is case sensitive, so everything's uppercase. It isn't it isn't too bad. We'll uh, we'll, we'll bring this up in the uh, in the little editor over here because it's it it has it has a lot of stuff in it that you would normally have in a in often a uh, library someplace. These are these are all the all the different modes for for, for setting up your output. Or your inputs and outputs on your on your pins. These are masks for the uh, for the particular pin, right? And then um, down here at the bottom is where I actually use those. It's probably more interesting to look at. Pin 13. It's a, this is in decimal. Pin 13 is is the LED number. Uh, I have to convert that into a bit field, and that's what this bit does. So that uh, gives me a constant for the LED. So later, next, I can make this an open drain. Output 2 means that I'm going to run it at a 2 megahertz rate. I have 2, 10, and 50. Uh, I combine those together. Uh, I take the LED number, and I configure it. And then I use the, it's on, the, on uh, pin, it's on 13 of, of the C port, so port C plus. 
and then I, I use a mask store on some of the things you can read and, and write that, that particular register, and so you can update it without having to, to cause damage to it. So uh, the output ports are pretty are really flexible. Uh, you can use a different address of the, uh, of the port to talk to, where you can just set bits, so you can arbitrarily set any number of bits you want or clear any number of bits you want independently as though they were a, a mask. So anytime you put a one in and you do a clear, it'll, it'll clear those, those, those bits of that port. But you first, of course, always have to translate it into a bit, which is what I use that, uh, that bit function for. So whatever the, your, 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 your port number is. So we can actually run that now since I have, I've loaded the code. And you can see that the LED happens to be on now, so I can turn it off. Didn't, oh, sorry. That's, uh, I mean, the wrong, that's what I mean about being at the wrong place at the wrong time. So let's go back to this guy. Okay, so now we're over there. Let's go off. And uh, that should work fine this time on. Okay. So, um, uh, unless there's some questions, I think that's about all I have. Uh, the other thing, these guys, these little guys are oftentimes called blue pills. Even though they may be red, they're still called a blue pill. Um, they're, see, did I talk about, uh, they, they come with uh, uh, 64K of, of flash and, and uh, 20K of, uh, of RAM. Um, I've, it was a little tricky. Uh, I have here hooked up, this is just an FDDI. Uh, you can run them with either a 5-volt serial or a 3.3 or a serial. Um, I use that as my power source to run it. Um, you can use a, uh, if you have the right application, you can download code into it, even from a USB. The USB, uh, if you get their library, which I haven't done yet, you can use the USB. These are, these are end, end, end devices. Am I, am I run out yet? Yeah. Oh, I'm done then. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody got some more questions? No, I don't have a lot more. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if you're using this guy, it's pretty crappy. Yeah. Because I don't use mine at all, so I know the, the connector's in good shape. <laughs> but it, it had to wiggle quite a bit to get it to work. Oh, anybody want to look at one of these little guys? You can see them. Yeah. Yeah, I bought one to put like a... Uh, yeah, yeah. I know, like McCris fourth. Yeah, for yeah, but that's a bigger fourth. It's, it's a bigger one. Yeah. It doesn't. It's not really suitable for this small a space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a good fourth. I really like it. I, yeah. T.S. Cook is very responsive yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah, and he's and he he, he loves it. Yeah. So he it's his baby. He, yeah. He's uh he's 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 uh willing to do all kinds of things for it. But like I said, it's really not designed for this size device. Yeah. 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 It's it's really no, you can get if you go to. Uh, uh, a L L I Express. You can find some that are a dollar seventy-five. Okay, I guess with free shipping. Yeah, I bought yeah. two of these, and they come with the pin headers just to solder. Yeah, on. yeah, I soldered the pin headers on. Not a very good job. Is this the dark web? <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna take this mic. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to intrude on your space. Thank you so much, Dwight. in the dark and grammarless world, that's a great talk title. One doesn't work, one just like Oh, and you've got your remote, and your pointer, and oh man, you're just...
interesting. Ready to make the drop. The motor, the thing will not decode until the motor is run. And it doesn't have to start the next thing. So you have to turn on the unit and then start it. Okay, but it still takes a couple of uh, characters to uh, So you can set a cues or whatever you like. to do some, some parsing, um, but, but why? Um, some of it probably was just uh, topics related to parsing had lately been on my mind, but I suspect this really really comes down to this. Uh, there's this little uh, tidbit in, in thinking forth that where Chuck points out the programmers just like to write interpreters because, you know, they're, you know. And uh, unfortunately, in, in context, of course, he was... Uh, uh, emphasizing that they do this sort of even when they don't really need to, uh, often uh, in a context in which uh, they're uh, building a domain specific language and uh, would probably be better off just you know, using the fourth interpreter itself. So, <laughs> but nonetheless, um, the, uh, of course, uh, the moment I got this urge, I, you know, w went and searched the interwebs and the, there's this uh, uh, great uh, uh, bit of work by um, uh, another Brad, uh, Brad Rodriguez out there who, uh, uh, a long, long time ago, uh, uh, did this uh, BNF parser, and I uh, this talk uh, leans very heavily on what he had done. I, I've uh, expanded upon it a little bit, but uh, it's uh, it's actually very, very clever, and uh, I, I am most appreciative. There was also this fellow on online who uh, had freshened it. It was uh, written in a uh, uh, let's say a slightly stale uh, dialect, at least relative to what uh, I could use in GForth and. Uh, this, uh, this fellow had uh, freshened it a little bit, and I at least uh, mined that for some inspiration. Um, so parsing. Um, the, the problem of parsing is, uh, uh, is, is in one sense, a, a, a very uh, fundamental problem with language. There's, uh, uh, you know, you've got some text uh, in some kind of a language, and uh, 
you want to uh, you want to apply it, find some structure within that. Now in fourth, of course, we have a you know very uh, simple uh, linear parser that just chops things up, and uh, white space is the divider. But uh, other uh, there are other possibilities. There are other uh, ways in which you can uh, try to add structure to your uh, uh, to the thing you're parsing, and um, in particular, uh, there's a uh, there's a notion of uh, uh, what's called a constituency-based parse tree, where you are uh, trying to say that you uh, you can sort of group together things uh, in the uh, in the in the text and describe them uh, at a slightly more abstract level. So you've got you know verb phrases and and uh, noun phrases and all of that. Um, and this applies to English. This applies to uh, artificial languages, programming languages, and uh, a sort of a central you know, theme in all of this is uh, uh, that uh, uh, you, you can do quite a lot to try to map, you know, meaning on top of uh, text and language. Um, but there's a uh, uh, there's a sort of a, a conventional way of going about this, and with programming, obviously, you th think in terms of uh, uh, the abstractions that we just saw there. You have some terminals, the text that's in your, uh, you know, that's in your uh, string that you're going to parse. Uh, and then you have your uh, you have your uh, your non-terminals or the sort of abstract things that you're building up. And there's all kinds of different ways you can you can sort of think about this. Um, Chomsky has this hierarchy of uh, you know sort of there's there's the you know at the limit type zero. It's a it's a Turing machine. It can do whatever to understand the the language, and you map from arbitrary terminals and non-terminals to uh, to, uh, to arbitrary terminals and non-terminals and cycle through that. You can narrow it down a little and talk about a narrower set of uh, languages where you you know it's, it's bounded, it will only run some number of cycles, and uh, you've got context around you, so maybe the set of things around you stays the same in all the transformations you do as you map from your input progressively to some understanding of it. Um, and then there's this, this really fun and interesting one, the context-free uh, languages, where you're mapping from, uh, non -ter from terminals to uh, some combination of, of terminals and non-terminals. Um, and that's the, that's the sort of space in which uh, sort of programming languages, artificial languages, fall in. There are different little corners of that that you can carve out that are, that are interesting and useful. Um, human language is probably you know, somewhere uh, in between two and one and two there, uh, because there's there's aspects of human language that's not uh, context free, um, and then of course there's this even narrower subset, the regular languages. This is you know, if you think reg regular expressions, um, and here you're you're basically limited to uh, uh, some even narrower uh, some narrow, narrower sets of rules. But this is this greatly uh, limits what you can do. You can't even do sort of things like matching, uh, matching up parentheses and things of that nature. So it's a very, very narrow uh, uh, set. So, we're f so the area that uh, Brad and his work looked at and, and that I'm looking at here is in, in that category too. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different approaches you can take to parsing. Um, there's the, the bottom-up approaches, and th these are sort of the, the these are the ones that are uh, the most performant and the most uh, sort of conventional. There's uh, uh, you can have a, a, a discrete finite automaton that uh, sort of consumes the, the text as you encounter it and uh, transitions through a bunch of states. That's, that one will work well for uh, the regular languages. Um, if you get to the point where you want to think about a subset of the context-free languages, then you have to start keeping around a little more state as you parse. Uh, and, a, and a very conventional way of doing this is what's called a shift-reduce parser, where you keep a stack. And then as you parse, you either push things onto that stack or you reduce things off of that stack um, and, and, uh, and then transition through a bunch of states. To, and there's a, there's a, there's a whole um, body of uh, uh, thought around this. And this is sort of the conventional tools make use of uh, various subsets that you can carve out uh, and, uh, and go from, uh, and, uh, go from a, sort of a nice human representation to something mechanical that will work in the shift reduce par uh, paradigm. You can actually build these by, uh, by hand, by the way. It's a, there's a, another, uh, uh, I, I've actually encountered uh, in, in my work life some uh, folks who, uh, there's a sort of a pattern for doing a, a manual shift reduced parser uh, where you, where you kind of similar to what you might do with a, um, a recursive descent parser, you kind of keep a tight correspondence between the, the grammar and how you lay out the code and you sort of can code the, the reductions. Um, it has pros and cons. It can give you a little bit nicer error handling, 
Um, and, it, and to the extent that you can do it manually, it's kind of fun. Obviously, uh, as we'll talk about in a second, there's tools that will help you build these if you want to go uh, down the sort of heavy-duty heavy, heavy duty route. Um, and then there's the top-down approaches, right? So bottom-up, right, you're starting from the text, and, and you're using the text, uh, the input text, as, the, as your guide as you parse. Top-down, you start and say, here is, I'm parsing a sentence. Let me explore the space of, uh, uh, of what that sentence might, sentence, how that sentence might be structured, and then down at the bottom, uh, match that up with the text. Um, this is what a recursive descent parser is, two, sort of two, two versions of this. They're, both, they're always recursive descent. Uh, and it's really just a question of whether you're leveraging look ahead to know that you've made the right decisions uh, throughout, uh, and, or to the extent to which you, use, you backtrack if you figure out that you've gone down the wrong path. And you assume, oh, I've got this structure. Nope, turns out that's wrong. You backtrack and, and pull out. Um, so, um, but in any event, there's, a, there's this uh, notation that's widely used. I'm sure you're all aware of Bacchus nor form. Uh, this was, came, was proposed originally in the context of Algol. Uh, it's Bacchus Knorr because uh, uh, there was Bacchus and there was uh, Peter Knorr who were on the uh, uh, on the All Gold Committee. Apparently, uh, I was noticing in Wikipedia. Apparently, Peter Knorr does not like being associated with this. Uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, he prefers it to be called Bacchus Normal Form. But you know, Newt uh, points out that it is a no, not a normal form, and so, anyways, uh, such such as it goes. Um, so this is this is what it looks like. You have a um, you have the uh, ter the uh, terminals uh, or sorry the non terminals uh, wrapped in angle brackets. You have this uh, colon colon equals as the symbol to indicate a, a transition you know to the right weirdly and that or sort of this is cons cons consists of that and then you have a set of uh, terminals or non terminals intermixed and then you use a pipe character to to indicate uh, to indicate uh, or so it's a digit or it's a digit and a number this sort of thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's usually what's that, that's the way I use five. Yeah, there's, there's, there's you there, could, there, there are many ways to, we'll get into the, this. You append on it and you can get, you know, really whacked out. Yes, there's, there's, a, there's, we'll get into that, 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 that topic in a moment, but yes, there's, a, there's, a, for this particular, for, for consuming a number in particular, but just to give an example of the notation. Um, there, uh, there's a tool, actually, if you look at Brad's uh, 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 document, he referenced a tool I had actually never heard of, uh, TMG. Uh, it's apparently an early, early Unix tool that predates uh, uh, Yak. Um, transmogrify. Yak What's that? Is that right, Yak and it predates them. It is, it is their ancestor. I had not, and I actually had a heck of a time on the interwebs finding information about it. Um, I was able to find a, uh, a very obtuse uh, uh, PDF that was not sort of project apart that had some examples of it, but the original paper on it is in some you know, paywalled thing that I, I couldn't figure out how to get inside of. Um, so this, paper. yeah, there was an actual paper, and it was in an actual printed journal, and you know, pages this to that, and oh, <laughs> good luck with that. Um, in any event, it's it, it's sort of the granddaddy. Yeah, and it, what what got me led me down this path, I should say, is that Brad mentions this in his. Uh, description as well. This is, you know, sort of work like this, uh, and it, his approach is similar to this tool. This is, I actually was able to find an example of the syntax of this tool um, on a page about uh, archaic languages that were themselves like obfuscated languages. So, <laughs> so it was in there along with that, uh, you know, intercal and uh, things of that nature. So um, in any event, this is apparently the syntax. Uh, at, it seems that th there were issues around uh, sort of you can only have sort of one branch at a time, very obtuse. But in any event, <laughs> I, I did manage to track that down. Um, but of course, the, the more contemporary thing is uh, uh, Yak, or it's uh, open source uh, descendant uh, Bison. Um, apparently, uh, another interesting bit is uh, uh, the, this uh, tool came into existence uh, originally because uh, the, uh, the B programming language is one of the pre precursors to C. Uh, this fellow wanted to uh, add an XOR op to it, and they said, oh, well, no, you should go clean up, the, clean up the parser as your first job. And why don't you actually go talk to Newth and figure out how to do it right? <laughs> Come up with a tool. So uh, this generates one of those subsets of uh, the, those uh, subsets of a uh, context-free grammar, an, uh, the, an LALR grammar. These are nice, particularly because you can take a BNF um, and convert it 
for a subset of languages, you can convert it to a shift reduced parser with a relatively small number of states. Um, and so that, that it has a number of sort of nice properties. Um, the tool, of course, lives on as Bison and is you know, widely used in all, all and sundry uh, on Unix when you want to write a parser. Um, it, has a, it has a sort of BNF-like syntax. You, you have your uh, non-terminal on the left, and then you have various reductions with pipes between. Um, as we'll talk about in a second, it also allows you to attach uh, uh, code to it, which is, is kind of useful. Um, so the, the goals that Brad had are re remarkably similar to mine, sort of provide this kind of functionality for forth and, and to keep it simple. So um, the, uh, th there's a, an interesting sort of subtopic. Typically, uh, at least in Unix, when you do parsing, you, you uh, separate lexing and, and parsing. And the, the motivation here uh, is that uh, you can typically uh, more succinctly express token boundaries with just that uh, regular language subset, um, and those are typically more efficient to parse. You can do you're, you can do them with a simple state machine, and so by separating lexing and and, uh, and uh, parsing, you can uh, you can make things more performant. You can also make things more conceptually simple. Um, the uh, other problem that it avoids is that if you combine the two, you you have the issue that now you have to in your grammar describe white space, uh, which can be tedious. Um, and the other nice property is that you can kind of, uh, inter especially if you're building a whole interpreter or compiler, you can interweave your symbol table with the lexer and, and do some nice things there as well. Uh, but it's complex, and so <laughs> um, much like Brad, I decided, yeah, let's 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 not let's do it in one, do it rolled in together. And so uh, in in Brad's parser and, and the the uh, variant of it that I've I've modified. Uh, you treat characters and, and end of lines as the tokens. This has all kinds of drawbacks, as we said before. Um, I, I did add a, a shorthand for strings to this, um, but uh, it does have uh, you know, the problem that white space, as, as we'll see. Um, so now digging into what I, what I did to some of So this is actually, I think, more or less intact from Brad's uh, uh, code. I should say, by the way, I'll, I'll put it up later, but uh, he manages to squeeze his whole tool into one fourth block. Uh, and then he follows it on by saying, well, and if it's too slow for you, here's some machine code uh, versus assembly versions of several of the key routines. Um, but in any event, what he does is he, uh, you're just, uh, keep, you have a word to give you the current, uh, the token at the current position. The token is just the current character out of, uh, out of the source, or it gives you zero if you're uh, at the end of the, the uh, the line. I should say one critical limitation uh, to his his approach that I inherited and, and and didn't do anything about is that he's coping with parsing only a single line, uh, which has pros and cons. But um, and then a word to advance to the next uh, to the next uh, character. Um, and then the, the key thing that he does is that you, because you're you're going to recognize a, a grammar, you want to uh, keep track of whether you're down a path that's successful or not. So he just keeps a global variable for this, and he has a word to check, uh, you know, is the, is the current uh, token correct if, if you're expecting a certain uh, value, and you, you reset the, the, uh, the flag uh, if, if you've gone down the wrong path and you got something unexpected. Um, in terms of using this in the tool, um, what, what Brad actually did is that he, he has a defining word token that you give a name to a particular token, and then you provide the character for reasons that puzzle me, honestly, he uh, manually puts in the ASCII code in hex for several of the characters in his samples, um, but you could do something like that. I found this a little tedious. I thought, oh, I'll do this sort of thing. I didn't like that syntax either. Um, I eventually added some words to inline, uh, to inline uh, references to tokens. This is a little inefficient, but it basically uh, wraps in a, a token check uh, for a particular character or for a whole keyword. Um, I'm still um, ambivalent as to about which syntax is nicer, and this is a this is the problem with devising your own syntax. You've got infinite rope, um, and this is how that how those are defined. And yeah, nothing shocking. Um, there's a special token end of line uh, that's handy to know when you've reached the end of line. Um, okay, so then the actual syntax that's used. So you've got BNF up here. Well, this is what uh, this is what he ended up on, and it's actually not not too bad. It's a little visually unsettling to have that gap there, but yeah. um, on the other hand, you get to use the, the fourth uh, parser as is. Um, 
So the way this, these work is that he's got a, um, uh, he sets, does sort of all the setup. He, he rolls in and marks them recursive because oftentimes these definitions are recursive. So you don't want to mess around with uh, worrying about not being able to call, reference the current word. So he just assumes every, every one of them will be recursive. Um, and then he's got these separate words for uh, stashing away uh, the state uh, that is relevant to the parse. And we'll, we'll see how that plays out in a second. So um, the idea is that you're going to have a, uh, one word per, uh, per grammar rule. And you're going to, as you execute, uh, walk down until the point that you discover that you've hit uh, a dead end and then backtrack sort of as expediently as possible. And so if we look back at uh, here, the idea would be that as you're walking down, you might parse and say, oh, okay, I've got a digit. Oh, no, it's not a number. Let me backtrack and then fall out of that. Let me look at this next case and so on. So how, how are we going to build that up? Um, He's keeping track of two things. He's keeping track of the source position and the output position, uh, which is actually a really fascinating choice. And it's one of the more novel things about uh, the approach that he takes. Um, because he's got this idea that as he's parsing, um, he's sort of thinking in terms of where am I at in the input? And if I have to backtrack, I backtrack the, 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 in, the input location. But I'll also backtrack the output. And so that lets him sort of do, do a bunch of things and then roll them back. Um, and he does this by producing text. Uh, I, I expand on this to do execution, which is was, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then the problem, of course, is you have to use the output wisely because he's actually storing it in the dictionary. So there's all kinds of constraints. But um, so the way this this then works is that you've got you know for for this at the start of each grammar rule, you stash away uh, if you're if you're at you've entered and and everything is you're still down a successful path, you stash away your uh, your input and output position. And uh, if it's unsuccessful, you bail because you're, you're done. If you're, uh, and then at the end, if you got all the way to the end of a particular grammar rule, then if you're successful, you ditch the, the old input and output state, and the new input and output state are now uh, what, what you want to keep uh, as you go forward. And uh, whereas if you failed, then you want to bail out, restore the old, uh, the old state. So that way, if you get all the way to the end of the, the rule, you're, you're, uh, you're bailing if, you, if things have failed, or you're keeping the state if it, if it succeeds. And so this lets you uh, walk down and succeed. Of course, then we get these, uh, these ors. We want to be able to, if we got all the way here um, and we failed at this point, we want to be able to fall into this alternative. Uh, and that's the, that's the sort of the next key thing. And so there, the idea is that you, um, uh, and might notice that this is because you haven't yet gotten to the end here. So you're, you, you'll keep going. Even though you've suppose that you you know suppose that this didn't parse and that didn't parse, you'll keep going until you chew through to the end, which is a little bit wasteful, but it is what it is. Um, so if you hit something, if you get to the pipe and you're successful, then you're done. You can bail out, return successfully. Um, otherwise, that's where you go and do the uh, pull out the old state again. And so so imagine that you're parsing and this is you know this worked. You return successfully. If this didn't work at this point, you reset your state back to what it was over here, and then continue on down. So um, one thing, of course, that this brings up your your point, John. Um, you got to be careful building these grammars because if you're uh, interpreting them uh, in this way, you're executing them. And so if you have uh, if you have a grammar rule that has this kind of a, a, a structure where you have a, a non-terminal and a non-terminal, you're just going to be Calling into yourself forever. Um, there is this is a this is a sort of a common problem in, in, in all kinds of the, the subsets of context-free languages. There's a well-known transformation you can do uh, to uh, to re rearrange this so that you're, you're you've got a, a non-terminal up front to help you make the right decision. Um, and there's a, actually a general approach. Um, oh, I have my, I actually brought my dragging book, but yeah, there's a <laughs> there's a uh, there's a general approach, and it's fun to fun to to see that he's referencing the Dragon Book, which is still the definitive reference in this kind of topic. Um, but, and there's a general way to do this, but obviously build, you could imagine building this into uh, to the tool and forth, but that's a lot of complexity. You can do this by hand. It's not that big a deal. Um, so the, the idea is that you can take a, a set of things like this, uh, where you've got, say, especially with infix, this comes up a lot, where you've got, you know, say, like, uh, <coughs> um, expression values up front and, and, and in your rules. And so you end up wanting to uh, reshuffle things so that you have some, some not, uh, terminals up front to help you make decisions. Um, 
so that's that's roughly where, uh, with the exception of those extra words to define tokens, that's where 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 Brad's example is at, and he does some cool things with it. We'll we'll look at that briefly in a second. Um, but basically, he he goes through and you know from input produces various outputs. One of the cool things about Bison and Lex is that, or sorry, Bison and uh, Yak is that they provide the ability to let you do uh, actions in line, and you can do that with with the way Brad has done things. Um, but the challenge is that you're doing that um, conceptually um, in the middle of the parse. And so you, if you insert other code, say, in the middle of one of these operations, um, if you got to that point during the parse, that's when you would run the code. And the, that's slightly different as to when, when Bison and, and, and Yak run, uh, run code in, in the same context, because you might have successfully gotten to that point but then as you complete uh, the rest of your parse, you may discover that you need to backtrack and undo the work that you've done. And so what, what Bison does is it actually runs these at the point that you know that this particular uh, position is actually going to stick in the final parse. Um, and so that's the behavior that I, that I wanted to strive for in, uh, in, uh, to add to this tool. Um, and so the idea is that you want to have it execute in the order that it happens in the productions. That, that part's fine. Uh, but you only want to execute when you know that it's good, when you've, you've got a successful parse. And the other thing that, is that there's this ability to pass around some state. And, um, and so I I'm, I'm do a little bit of work to emulate some part of that, although um, unlike, uh, uh, unlike this where there's a, there's a uh, so like dollars one corresponds to this you know, first element in the thing, and dollars three is the second element, and so on, um, I, I found I was able to get by with a single state variable. We'll, we'll talk about that more with some context. So, um, so what I ended up doing is using this idea that Brad has of storing uh, the output as a stream of stuff that you can roll back, but instead of storing into it uh, your output directly and, and intermixing computation, I store in the current value of the state variable and then an execution token for one of these uh, uh, pieces of code that I want to embed in line. And so I'm able to provide a syntax like this where um, you have various you know, you have your various uh, ter uh, non-terminals and terminals, and then I, I use double double uh, uh, double uh, curlies because of there's uh, single curlies are used for locals and uh, <laughs> in GForce. But um, and so you're able to to then embed code that will be deferred until you actually know that this position will stick. Um, or and in a more complex example, um, you're able to use this dollar sign uh, double dollar sign value as something that you can store things in that you've done in line during the parse and then have that value for later when you actually need it. So for example, here at the point that you've done the parse, you've got the value of this digit, you can store it away so that later when you you know that this is going to stick, you have that value available to uh, to help you actually build up the the uh, the, the correct digit there uh, and let you let you do things with it. And this is a screw up because of HTML and uh, does not like less than and greater than. Apologies for the slide. Um, <clears throat> so this is how these these words work. There there are uh, lots of postponing and fun. Um, there's a little bit of uh, 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 carnal knowledge in terms of the fourth year. I uh, end up having to stash away the um, uh, the origin so I can have a head that jumps from one word into another word. Um, there, depending on your particular fourth. Uh, you may need to do something different, uh, but this allows me to have that end a word, uh, I end a word, start a new no-named word, uh, keeping track of its execution position, and then define, you define whatever action you want to have, uh, jump over that piece of code, and then do the, uh, start the next, resume the word, uh, re resume the prior word, uh, storing away the, uh, the state uh, the state and the XT uh, onto the uh, into the dictionary. So at this point, let's quickly pull out and uh, do a demo and code tour. Uh, is this readable? Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Uh, okay. So um, so this is to give you a sense again of how small this thing is. I mean, this is basically it uh, and this and you know Brad's was even smaller. I've I've splayed it out a little bit in terms of the, the core of the parser, um, and then uh, let's start with a 
very simple example. So here's a, um, actually, it, it, um, actually, let's start with a different example. Let's start with, so uh, here's a, here's a uh, here, this one gives an example of uh, the problems you would have parsing with spaces. So I've ended up defining a, uh, a, a blank space, you know, one or more blank spaces or uh, zero or more blank spaces. And then uh, I've got a bunch of nouns for cat, dog, pig, chicken, and verbs for eats, likes, hates. And then I've defined some sentence grammars where you have a noun, some number of spaces, a verb, uh, some number of spaces is a period, or noun, verb, noun. Um, and then I'm able to set up a parsing word to say, okay, does this successfully parse? And it throws if you don't. Uh, so cats can eat dogs and all of that. But for, exa oops. But for example, if I say uh, dog, dog, cat, uh, it doesn't like that. Uh, but if I say dog eats cat, then it's okay. Uh, so that's, that, that's just basic... Uh, uh, you know, uh, confirmation that you can successfully detect correct grammar. Now here I'm attaching some actions. Um, so here I'm actually, uh, once the, once the uh, noun parses, I'm going to print uh, in response to that. And then similarly the verb. And then what I do is I defer um, the, so I, I go ahead and, uh, uh, I go ahead and, uh, what do I have? Oh yeah, sorry, this is a period. So I'm, uh, I'm, uh, oh, sorry, I'm not printing. I'm storing the string on the stack. So I store a bunch of, you know, the, the noun, the, the, uh, so the noun will give me a string on the stack. The verb will give me a string on the stack. I'm doing some swapping so that I can uh, frob the ordering. And so when they say cat eats, I will say, uh, 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 well, let me just show you all. Uh, it, it does some. It, it inverts the the order of the sentence and, and sort of turns it into a question. Cat, you eat. Dog, eat you. Eat, eat dog. This sort of thing. So you can play play with the ordering. I'll look at something a little more elaborate. So there's a similar uh, thing where I'm taking a, um, and this is derived slightly from one of Brad's examples. I'm taking uh, a uh, a digit and I'm building up the uh, the numerical value of it. I'm printing that value at the point that I've got. I know that it's uh, done, and then I'm building up uh, the uh, the fourth words to to execute the expression. So it's able to turn a, an expression like uh, so it, um, it's able to turn uh, a an infix expression into a postfix expression. So that's sort of one level of embellishment. Um, the next sort of refinement, this is that same grammar, um, but now I've attached, instead of attaching the, uh, uh, the printing, I'm attaching the actual action. And so uh, I'm deferring and do, doing these, and because I, I can set, I know that this will only happen at the point that this, uh, this, rule, this, this is a successful point in here, uh, there's no danger of backtracking at that point, so I can actually execute the expression and get the, get the value out. And so for, for I can load a value in X and then have it uh, have fourth, uh, in a fairly small number of lines, understand an infix expression. So, uh, but of course, there's one, one problem with that, which is that uh, that assumes that you're going to execute it at the point that you encounter the expression, which is not quite what you would want if you wanted to use this in real code. So if you change things around ever so slightly so that you instead... Um, Instead, what you want to do is actually <coughs> build up the code that executes the expression uh, so that you can run it later. Then you could define a word that uses that expression, which is what you actually want to be able to do to use an infix expression and forth. And so you can then do something like this at the bottom where you have this expression word. It, it puts the code into the dictionary to do, uh, to do that. And then um, in this example, I'm going to actually do C foo, so we'll get to see what, what, what actually gets left in the dictionary. But then you can actually use foo um, to, ev to evaluate this expression, and you can do it several times. Or you can use it, there's a version of it where you can just do it, uh, it, it as an immediate, or as a, uh, as a, as a non-compile word. So to give you a sense of what that does, 
So this is kind of interesting. So, so obviously, you know, the words work, and, and it does the, the appropriate thing here for, for you know, computing the results. You can use them if you, if you have trouble with, with postfix. Um, what actually ends up living on the stack, you'll notice that there's, um, uh, actually, I should print cat. So, um, so you'll notice that the um, so I have this uh, x x bang that shows up in the definition of foo, and then there's this a head which jumps way down to here, skipping over all of these things, which are the value of those state variables intermixed with uh, execution tokens for all of the actions that were in the grammar. So those get left over uh, on the on the stack in the middle of that or in the middle of this expression. Um, and then in order to actually then build the remainder of the code, which does this, uh, it, uh, it, it goes through and loads this into the state variable, executes this, loads this, and so on. And so that generates this code, um, which you can then run and use. So um, one other thing I wanted to ever so quickly put up here. Um, this is sort of an interesting contrast with... Uh, uh, Brad's approach was to sort of intermix, uh, intermix uh, 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 string building on the stack, which is a whole, or into the dictionary, which is a whole different approach. There's pros and cons to either. Um, it's nice to be able to actually have that, that, that execution happen at that time. I wanted to put this up here, though, because I, I, I love, I love uh, this, uh, you know, his having packed it into a single block and how beautiful and succinct that is, uh, <laughs> which is just, endlessly impressive that a thing like that can be. Uh, and, and of course, then he follows it on with these, these uh, x86 machine code versions. Um, so that's that. Um, how are we doing on time, Kevin? Kevin's asleep. What's that? 319. 319. Is that, is that good or bad? No, I'm supposed to start. Oh, OK. Well, I'm going to. Uh, OK, I'll keep. All right, so that, that's all on the parsing. If there are any questions on the parsing. Yes. Uh, just a, a statement. Yes. Uh, I couldn't find anything online for transponder five, but yes. in 1964, there was the great, great, great grandfather of all parser generators uh, called Meta 2. Huh. Uh, you might want to look it up. It's uh -huh. very simple. Uh -huh. uh, there's even an online demo that you can Oh, online. intriguing. So the paper for TMG titled Syntax Directed Compiler for Algol 16? Probably. That sounds plausible. That oh, cool. I would, I would love the link. Um, cool. There's also one in G4 called Gray. Okay. Mm. Cool. Is it, is, it, is it similarly uh, the, the, the backtracking parser, or is it... Uh, I don't I did. I did very briefly when it, when this sort of general area to ponder uh, occurred to me. I thought, well, maybe I'll do a do one of these uh, uh, you know LALR ones. But it's like that's all. Yeah. It, then then you got to build up a lot of state. There's a lot of things to do. There's yeah. It's, it's a lot of complexity there. So you have to precedence has to fall out of the the rules that you embed with, with a a tool like uh, like Yak. What you can do is have a grammar that has uh, ambiguous uh, as ambiguous reductions. Here it will it will just parse it will it will take whatever parse is the first one to be successful. So you have to lay out the grammar in such a way that the the uh, the precedence order that you want ends up being the first one to parse. You could imagine structuring it so that it will backtrack and, and hit multiple of them and then setting some kind of a, a, a rule to, uh, to disambiguate. But then you would have to be able to both uh, backtrack but also sort of know which way to weight uh, the precedence. There might be, I, I, haven't th I haven't thought it through, but there may be a way to decide once you're all the way down to a success condition uh, or, or at least far enough down a success, a success condition, decide if you decided the precedence in the right direction in each of the cases that you've hit so far. But I don't know if you can, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question, whether you can, uh, whether you can make the decision. I, I don't think you can do it with wholly local information. I think you need slightly more global information to decide if you got the precedence ordering correct or not. But, um, which, of course, with, with uh, an LALR uh, uh, tool uh, like Yak, they're able to, to, to do that because the, uh, they, they can look for, uh, they can use it as a way to resolve shift-reduce uh, conflicts. And decide which way to go. I uh, just want to make a note that uh, Lex is superseded with 
Bison. Uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Lex and Flex. Sorry. Yes. Been, yeah. Yes. Yes. Flex. Flex is the GNU. The GNU Lex, and similarly, Bison is the GNU Yak. Sorry. Yeah, but it's, but it's better. Bison and Flex. <laughs> yeah. Both. Both. I believe Bison as well has some additional features in it. One of the key ones is the ability to. Uh, the original tools assumed that you were building a single parser for your. Uh, for, for, for your, your program, both Flex and, and Bison have the option to say, I'm j I've got several different parsers that are a part of my program and get, give them a separate namespace and you know, bind to them separately and all of that. And um, back when the Bacchus and Hour paper stuff was coming out, that was in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Shortly after that, the end of the 60s or very early 70s, I still have a book called Compiler Compiler. Instruction basically um, using the context to build additional lang compilers mm -hmm. from a construction you know, of the yeah. parse trees. And yeah. stuff. You usually come up with the grammar yeah. and your uh, symbols. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. And it, it's it was really nice. I started doing languages before I came across Forth, and it made the transition really fun. Yeah. Um, one last thing uh, on parsers, for me at least. Um, you might also want to look up something called Pratt parser. I talked about it before. Yeah, it turns out that Forth interpreter is itself a degenerate Pratt parser. Yeah. Also. So Very cool. The um, <laughs> there are a couple of things that I, I just remembered. I had one more slide here. There are a couple of things that um, that I did didn't get to that I had meant to tinker with a little bit, but yeah, uh, there are a few places where it would be convenient to to have a, a syntax and do a clean star, and it's frequently the case with variations of BNF that you. Ooh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, I tried a little bit. It's tricky to get it right and fit it into the syntax of the uh, uh, and the state changes that you need. Uh, but I, I haven't convinced myself it's not doable uh, with with some easy one liner. Multi line, I'm st I'm not sure. There, there, it's real nice to just fit right into the the fourth parser. But then you run into uh, the fact that if you're going to backtrack, then you have to be able to backtrack to the you know, potentially more than one line. And what do you do with that? So. Um, and, and in general, I'm still pondering whether I like the syntax or not. But on the other hand, the other thing this re-reminds me is at the end of the day, if you're trying to produce a domain-specific language and for forth, unless you really need something that, that needs, you know, maybe like an infix, infix uh, uh, tool, I'm not sure this is the best way to go. For, forth kind of naturally does, does things nicely without you having to go to these lengths. Um, do we have time for the, the haikus, or we could bump that to a future? There was, I will I'll tell you what, I will show one haiku then, just because this one showed up and I, I, I why, right. the, why is this one not loading? There we go. Um, for some reason, this one just made me happy, but I don't know. Oh, I should say, by the way, actually, there's one other one I, I want to bring up, actually. Sorry, he said, it's famous last one. Uh, where to go here? Uh, I, I mentioned it because we uh, we got a greeting from uh, oops, where to go here? Uh, you can't see this here. Let me zoom in. Oops. <laughs> Greets Darkstar AG Brad N Manwe. Uh, 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 I believe this is Sam Chen Ting Stainless and anyone I forgot, keep at it. So uh, we, this is from our, our friend uh, uh, Boom Lind. <laughs> Uh, wherever he may be. <laughs> so. So, with that, thank you all.
get a screen back again. My screen was blank. So, well, <laughs> it was black. Then, I'm going to show you on my laptop a slide of the Weird Stuff Warehouse truck enjoying its retirement on a residential street uh, near my house. It's over there near the Stevens Creek Trail. Oh, is somebody so, living in it now? No, I think it's, <laughs> I think that the, it's in front of somebody's house. The other vehicle I can see in this slide is a uh, Hummer. So whoever it is isn't poor. The truck is retired. Somebody might have bought it. I, I understand. Remember Webvan? I understand somebody bought a Webvan just to have one. You know, their kid thought the Webvan was cool. Bought brought ice cream and food for him, and, and so the little eight-year-old's parents bought him a wet van, so uh, in some future time might see him driving around in it when he's uh, older. That would be oh. out. Oh, microphone. I suppose you want something. You can get stuff. So are you ready to go? All right. Anybody hungry? <laughs> so, yeah, these are all basically everybody uh, before they let everybody in, of course. Your traditional cupcakes, the Robo uh, horse, pretty cool. Nobody there. The waiting pen for humans. This guy was pretty interesting. This this thing is like, uh, he said it was like 17 to 20 pounds of uh, plywood that he had to kind of construct and put together. The heaviest parts were the uh, hands and the pincers that he had to actually rest on his uh, hip. Uh, otherwise, they would wear out his arms. And he can't obviously walk that fast, as you can tell. <clears throat> no, it's human powered. He's going to make modifications to it at some point to make it less weighty. But then, of course, we have our drivers of electric vehicles. <laughs> now, this was a really great company. I, I, I'm going to probably, uh, he's making some mods to this uh, product. But it's a, uh, he, you can act, he built, he doesn't, he builds the squares that are there with uh, the mounting holes for each of the different types of equipment. And then the railing system that you see there is stuff that you can buy off the shelf. So he's actually creating uh, can, these elements right here. And then uh, he, as you can see, he's got an Arduino here. He's going to create one where you can have two Arduino projects running off of a, two separate uh, breadboards. And um, he has power hookups that he's going to be placing on here, uh, hopefully at some point, so that you can hook up your, you know, 5 volt and grounds and all that. So you've got arms you can stick on it. <clears throat> I think we can zoom in right here. So, and they're really heavy duty uh, plastic uh, that he mills out himself. <clears throat> and you can have multiple risers uh, for these through holes. These are just stuff he bought off, you know, off the shelf. Very cool design. What, what is the purpose of that thing? Uh, prototyping. Mm -hmm. And you can chain, uh, you can see that they have these cuts in here. So you can actually tie a whole bunch of these together to create an entire project. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, the thing is, it, it does have it where you can hook it up on eat every side, so you can grid the whole thing out. No. Uh, well, right, yeah. But check them out. It's a great product, uh, and they build it to your specifications how you want it. Mm -hmm. Probably. I, I'd probably hit his website. He's updated it by, by now, I hope. So this is a prototype. The, they have gone, they're, they're doing a Kickstarter on this. Uh, this is, theirs is not really flexible. It fits on the palm and it acts as a remote control. So you can do it for presentations, like mouse replacement. It has four buttons underneath for your fingers, uh, as you see here. Let me zoom in. It's a small little <laughs> microprocessor on this thing. It's pretty neat, Bluetooth LE. Uh, has 3D accelerometers. And it's a nice little package, though. They're going to make some design changes on it. And it'll just be quite interesting to see what they actually come up with. Then, of course, uh, the robots. This one was very non-threatening, as you can tell. It has, like, no mouth, uh, has no glowing eyes. It, you know, <laughs> but it does have cameras, obviously, in in the in the front. So, uh, yeah, it's not it's not there, but it does talk to you, plays music, it 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 has uh, leaves you can leave messages for other people. It's kind of yeah. <laughs> so as you see here, um, there. Trying to make it so that you can use it while you're in a VR state or do remote control of anything that's like Bluetooth LE or anything like that. So pretty neat. We don't know where it's going to go, but it's kind of nice. Sony's getting rid uh, into the audio space, and they had some <laughs> amazing uh, demos that they did. All this other stuff that I didn't actually, I wasn't really interested in the uh, flying the drones kind of portion of it. But this little guy here was able to drive these, you know, semi-big speakers. They uh, soldered on standard uh, um, copper cable to the back of this board and running it off this little tiny chip. So this is all running off five volts. This is just an ex uh, expansion board, but everything's running off this little guy right here. It has uh, GPS, Bluetooth. Uh, it has a um, uh, basically a decoder for the sound system. Has air all the amplifiers built into it. Uh, it probably can't drive anything larger than these speakers, but if you were because uh, I'm doing a kind of like a wireless speaker project right now. And, you know, something like this is pretty amazing. It, it, you don't really need anything else to drive the speakers except for that little chip. So um, this is kind of a fuzzy close-up of it. But it's... Is that they're, what they call Class D? Class D? Yeah. I would think it'd be class D for, for power. Yeah. It's got, so you need power efficiency, otherwise you yeah. smoke the board. Well, the thing is, uh, I think it was, I forgot how many microamps. This thing is really low. Well, it's, yeah, the drivers are on this board. This, as I said, is just a daughter board to connect the uh, um, speakers to. Because... Uh, it has uh, this weird pinout on the back of the board, um, which is a little hard to play with. 
So you actually have to buy something like this to plug it into. So you can obviously see how big it is, and then they have a couple of different versions of theirs. They got camera boards, um, add-on boards, and uh, a EMCC add-on board. Uh, they're getting trying to get into some uh, the space controllers and everything. Uh, of course, the uh, wall bot. Everybody knows that you can scan your wall and see what's inside. Very cool. Huh? Well, studs, uh, screws in your floor, you know. Yeah. It, and it and it's you don't have to cut a hole in the wall to figure that out, which is nice. Well, then you can drill real fast and just get them. Yeah. Well, you can use a microwave for that. So, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> yeah, this has been around. They've actually improved uh, their uh, um, their controller a lot more than it's been the last couple years. Um, they've added additional. Um, support for, uh, you know, extending their language base. It's got more RAM. So, and they're introducing another product, which was something to deal with lights that you could talk to, um, which wasn't actually out yet. So, but again, you know, a lot of stuff I was looking at, you know, voice or uh, sound related, which this kind of fits the bill. It's really uh, the only thing that doesn't have to connect to the internet, you can program all your words and uh, then take those words through Arduino and then output it to your pins and have it do whatever you want it to do. So, now this guys are called the Hexabits. Um, they have tons of different modules. And their idea is is that you can connect everything you know that you want at, on the edges. So you have multiple pads for power, ground, inputs on all sides. So you can actually build your projects as you want to, and just solder those particular joints together to create a, a good project. And they have obviously Bluetooth, wireless, SD cards. Mm -hmm buttons, you know, crystals, battery holders. I mean, it's do-it-yourself paradise there. Tiny FPGAs, they're a big thing now, so you can program. Nice little setup. Fun fact, those tiny FPGA boards use the yeah. same Uh, really? Hmm. Nice. Uh, this company just sells interface connectors for boards. I mean, if you need something to, you know, build your stack or just interconnect with anything, they seem to have it. So. That was worth noting. This is a uh, particle. Uh, obviously, this is the particle chip right here. So, let's, and they're, <laughs> they're running games on this, uh, multiple games. Every one of these it was playing some type of uh, um, game. It's got wireless and all their other uh, controllers built into this. Um, just trying to show the diversity. Uh, what's nice about their stuff is they automatically, if you're not programming your own firmware and you're using their base firmware for this, it will automatically update uh, to something new once it's connected to the internet. So you don't have to worry about any security holes. 
um, if they find something or you report something and those get approved, they'll get pushed out to all your particle products that are out there, as long as it has a connection. So they're really big in security because they know that a lot of their stuff is on the edge and, you know, that's where the weakness comes in. So uh, this is just another company uh, doing prototyping. Blueberry didn't really uh, get a chance to stick around and talk to these guys, but they are just creating a bunch of Bluetooth LE devices that are out there doing something. So I'm not sure. These guys are, this this is a really nice product. Yeah. It, yeah, it's, they, you get the software and everything um, is kind of built into their little breadboard. And as you see, this is their circuit right here. And then you, you build whatever you want and then you'll be able to track that on your screen based on your pro. What kind of bandwidth does it get? What do you think? 100 gigahertz. 200 megahertz, right. Well, obviously, you can probably go to Enscope and check out their little thing. Uh, I don't remember what this whole circuit was for, but it's uh, it just shows you that they can tap into different points, and then uh, you can see the output. Uh, <laughs> I just had to take a picture of this because this is uh, odd. <laughs> This, this is nothing new. It's been around for, you know, Decades. yeah. And so this company is putting a MP3 player uh, and just hooking it onto some circuit that they were prototyping. And they're, I think they're trying to look for funding as well. And it just, you know, hooks up to your uh, head and plays audio. But I don't want Bluetooth, you know, sitting right on my temple right there. So the Enscope says uh, four analog channels, four million samples per second. So single shot, probably like a 500 kilohertz side wave that you take to the GSM. Okay. Uh, this is uh, during a little Beagle board presentation. And I just captured these just for the uh, website. So they have a few projects that they're working on. Uh, that was a nice uh, demonstration of the Beagle board. And they're actually doing robot cars. So <laughs> that was uh, nice to see. So you can create your own cards. Uh, sculpture. Steel, right? Hmm? That's stainless steel? Uh, yeah. That's rock. Rock and rock unobtainium. Unobtainium, yeah. Oh. Yes. This is a company that's just, re, you know, building antique things. Yeah. yeah. Well, since it's sprayed with, soaked with fire retardant and stuff, so try not to burn it because you'll, you'll die from the fumes. But, and of course, R2-D2s are around, and BB-8s growing, and this, uh, they have it opened. I don't know if it actually works, though, but nice little model. Robots. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, I think, a kit that you can buy. Little Land Rover-ish thing. Hobby Robotics. Another Kickstarter. Homebrew Robotics Club for Silicon Valley since 1984. These guys were fun. This, <laughs> They're selling the... Uh, kits 
uh, different kits for this little dancing robot. So you can get you can put them together, and he plays music, and uh, it is very well designed. And of course, your proverbial uh, recliner. Nice, I like it. And the uh, I forgot what this thing was. Some kind of steamboat looking kind of idea. And I thought this was going to be something really uh, fun, but. I don't know what the heck they were doing in this. Well, they're trying to put this robot up here, this little bot. I don't know what the heck it was supposed to do. I mean, they worked on this thing for hours. I walked back and forth thinking it was going to be done, but they never finished. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, on the arcing of a roof, yeah. <laughs> and of course, your standard Darlac was running about. Yeah, this kid decided to pose in front of me once. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this was uh, pretty amazing. Look. I see. Let me uh, go out of full screen here. Uh, this is a uh, one from the little robotic kind of. Uh, it would be like to open up an umbrella automatically. <laughs> Maybe a propulsion system like a, a jellyfish-ish type of thing. Uh, maybe not. So this is the, this is what this looks like. And that was a really neat effect. Uh, just the pulsing of the lights. Yeah, a lot of LEDs. This was, I think, the coolest thing I saw there uh, in the dark room. And obviously the flash came on, but it's a tower that they created out of obviously multicolor LEDs controlled by this little controller box that you see on the, on the base here. And then it's all to music that they uh, set up. And uh, this is what it looks like. I will not play the sideways one for you because it's annoying. Uh, I don't have the sound, but... So he's playing on the, on the acrylic keys that are lit up. So... So as he's playing the keys, you can see that it's emitting the, the light that color of the light that's underneath it and it was just the way it it strobed was just uh, quite amazing and of course they're uh, selling the parts as well so then your standard mushroom blow up doll uh, this is what you can do with PVC if you have enough time uh, it's a, it's a little dark, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, you drop a, you know, a little ping pong ball at the top and it ends up going into the next dimension, I think. So. So this is the live action enactment of the screensaver, right? 
Uh, <laughs> you know, that could be true. <laughs> I didn't think about that, but... No. Um, if anybody remembers Star Trek, uh, this is the one where they had the uh, three brains that were un underneath in the middle of the planet where they would force people to fight each other. And they would and they would be betting on who would. Yes, and actually that that this is all Jello, right? <laughs> so I didn't really want to touch it because you know so many hands have been on this. <laughs> it was just like weird, but neat idea, you know. Uh, some really uh, nice art, cut metal with the they just. Put Put obviously strobing for for uh, fluorescent uh, type rotating LEDs or so forth. It's really neat. Uh, taking your work uh, a little too seriously here. Driving a desk. Very. I got him to pose for that, by the way, if you can tell. And then this is a uh, plywood art, I think. And then this uh, structure, which had like, I'm not sure what, I think with plastic, like feathers art. This sculpture was quite amazing. I don't know how long this thing took to build, but uh, I mean, it's got a lot of parts in there. I mean, everything you can imagine. Pipes, hooks, uh, obviously this is to lift the guy up, but wrenches, <laughs> I mean, quite amazing. So that's the uh, artist if you want to uh, get a bear. There's another one. Solar horn. Your shark display, hammerheads, Mad Max type of car, and of course, land speeder. There was? Oh. <laughs> And of course, fluffy things. Somebody was trying to actually get into that and drive it around. Uh, I think I got something of that. Oh, yeah. So, this is some thing you are supposed to sleep in. Uh, I don't see why, but it will rotate to a flat position or something. Uh, this guy was walking around with a uh, articulating skeleton in front of him. Uh, he had a obviously a harness, and he had to walk around this table with this skeleton in front of him to get a bottle of water. It was quite, you know, humorous, you know. Then he sat back down. It was uh, obviously robotic kicking legs uh, was not happening at the time I took the picture. Uh, steam engine. Yep. And this was a gas fire, and they're running it on pecan shells. So, part of some biomass thing. Yeah, they're uh, shooting a lot of fire off of this thing. This thing was so hot. I mean, you could feel it like. 30 feet away. Uh, 
And then this was a motorcycle with a dragon head and wings on it. That was and you can obviously buy this, right? I guess that's a joke, right? <laughs> yeah, 88 bitcoins. You too can have... 88 bitcoins? Yeah, it's a lot of money. Yeah. It doesn't even... I don't even think it flies, but... <laughs> Here, I think this is the phone you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, this company, I, I did not take a picture of their little circuit board, but what they are creating, they create the software uh, and a circuit board to do um, sign illumination. And you could s pattern it in the software to cycle through many different inputs all at the same time. I don't know if anybody ran into them. They're like right in the front door of the main hall. Uh, very neat stuff. Very neat stuff. And that's it. That's it, folks. We are done for the month. We'll see you next month. Bye.